morning. This is George Brown, golf course manager at Chambly Hotel. We looked at the Open Golf Championship starting today. Can I phone up for a forecast, please? Well, I think today getting off to a good dry and bright start. There will be a front um, working its way down from the northwest, and then it looks like a, a good uh, couple of days coming up after that. In 1982, I had my left hand on this trophy. 1988, I had my right hand on this trophy. Now, at last, I finally got both hands on it. <laughs> and does it feel good? <laughs> Precious as the old parrot jug, other tools needed for the fire. Little darlings, I love them all. <laughs> And the oak is all about the young man. The toast, ladies and gentlemen, is Gary. May he, uh, 1994 saw so Gary Player's 40th consecutive appearance. And it's an astonishing achievement. But, as you might expect, the little dynamo still remembers how it all began. My first Open Championship was at St Andrews. And what a spot. Aren't you lucky to play your first Open Championship at St Andrews? Well, I couldn't afford to stay at these, uh, these hotels in those days, and I slept in those sand dunes along the beach with my waterproofs on uh, just for the first night, and then I found a room eventually which didn't have a curtain in it, and these are wonderful memories to have. Thank you very much indeed. When these champions tee up this week, Greg Norman or Nick Faldo or Ernie Els or any of these uh, outstanding players, they're feeling very nervous. Jack Nicholas doesn't matter who it is. And the day you lose your nervousness is a, is a very sad day. That's the time you shouldn't be playing anymore. Any time you go back to defend a championship, whether it's a British Open or any regular golf tournament, uh, you, you want to keep that trophy you had uh, because you feel good about it. There's no better feeling than sitting down at your desk and seeing the claret jug sitting right in front of you for 12 months. You know, that's a great feeling. But no better, I suspect, than the feeling he had when winning the previous year with the lowest winning total in the history of the championship. Now he's back to defend the title at the venue where he first triumphed. The golf course is a totally different golf course. Of all the British Opens I've ever played, um, this is by far the best conditioned golf open championship I've ever seen. The great thing is I can play with my kids out there on the par three now, where in 86 I couldn't. <laughs> they, were, they were too small, but that's the, that's the most special thing for me so far this week, watching the kids, you know, eight and 11 years old making birdies out there. That, that's pretty good. They might beat me, but I won't let them beat me. <laughs> I'll tell you that. triumph in 86 was a second round 63 in conditions very different to those experienced this time round. Deep rough and vile weather were the order of the day, but while Norman powered on, the rest could do little more than just survive. And that year, it wasn't only the players that struggled. On the Sunday before the tournament in 86, we had almost tropical conditions with um, constant rain and you could almost see the grass growing. And we had a hell of a job on the Monday and Tuesday before the tournament to get pace on the greens. About midday Wednesday, the temperature dropped, the wind moved to the north, and the grass is just retracted. I mean, we was there on the Thursday and Friday, uh, virtually cutting fresh air. There was nothing there at all. And Tom Watson um, criticised afterwards that the greens were slower for the practice than they were for the tournament, which he thought was unfair. But that wasn't done deliberately, which is Mother Nature. And getting ready for 1994, so for Mother Nature wasn't any usual. kinder. A cold spring yeah. and no rain to speak of in May or most of June. Basically, apart from the first two or three days in May, we had nil every single day. But you couple that with cold northeasterly winds and the, the grass was just stunted, it never moved at all. Not just at Turnbury, but I think most of Scotland. And then July, everything was almost perfect until the players turned up on Sunday. And here we are, almost 17 mil on Sunday. But I'd like to see that go back to nil for the next few days, and I'd like to see the wind go up to 20 or 40 mile an hour, 
and I think they really would enjoy it even more so. Right, lads. That's what we've been waiting for for the last couple of years. Off to bright start. Weather forecast is pretty good. Dry and sunny. Lovely, Day one, 4am. Uh, Tired greenkeeping team by way, lifted by night. an enthusiastic governor. <coughs> of course, they're looking really good last night. Other compliments. North section, Tom and Jimmy Johnson. You'll be going with a gentleman from the RNA. Are you going to use the, the brush or the spray? The brush? Ah, I think it's better. I think that's everybody. This is somebody hiding. Best of luck. Of course, you're looking great. Another three days and you've cracked it. We're late. Off we go, lads. Cheers. I've been fiddling around with grass for 40 odd years now, and um, uh, I really think I'm still doing my apprenticeship. I've been fortunate enough to see some of the top courses um, you know, in, in this country and you know, America and Japan. And um, I just want to achieve standards as good, if not better, than other championship courses and come rain or shine where do it. Well, he's a good greenkeeper. He knows exactly what he's doing. Like looking after a baby, I think, you know, it's, it's every need. And uh, when you have to feed it, when you have to stop feeding it, <laughs> he does it well. This is unbelievable. Absolutely brilliant. What time did you get to bed last night? So Turnbury was ready, weather set fair, a huge crowd didn't have long to wait for the excitement to begin. Jumbo Zaki at first. Onto the green and into the hole for Eagle 2. Couple under, right at the start. At the other end of the course, Andrew McGee. Oh, yeah. One under through 16, this his second to the par 5, 17. Two great shots against the wind. An eagle three to give him a share of the lead, with this young man, Jonathan Lomas. This his approach to the 14th. And very much a case of anything you can do, I can do better. And the lead on his own once more. In the end, a round of 66. Well, I'm delighted, yeah, it's, uh, to not, to, not uh, to make any mistakes coming in. I, I, I struggled a bit towards the end, but uh, no, it's nice, nice to be up there. I've tried for years to try and get in. Level par for the last three rounds would see him in 11th spot. Not bad in your first championship. Yeah, I was kind of nervous. It was... It was a different feeling. Uh, I got to the first tee and I felt, whoa, this is the Open, if you know what I mean. <laughs> different indeed when you arrive as US Open champion. In the end, though, he did all right. Three rounds under 70 and a respectable top 25 finish. Not so Payne Stewart. Here, his second to 16, finding Wilson's burn. His ball and with it his chances disappearing with the tie. But at least he wasn't alone. A good start for the combustible John Daly, two under after eight, and here launching yet another missile past the lighthouse at the ninth. Again, another longest drive of the day. Leaving him little more than a chip to the green, and this putt had him out in 32. Oh. Elsewhere, it was clearly Japan's day for the spectacular. Hiroshi Goda emulating Azaki, this time at the 14th. <laughs> yes, Papanovic at the 11th. This putt was to take him to two under, on his way to a round of 68. <laughs> but Greg Norman in trouble at 15. I didn't play very well today. I didn't have a whole lot of rhythm. Um, it was just one of those days where I just struggled and I uh, didn't deserve much of a better score than 
Nick Faldo also struggled, and even this great approach to 16 was only good enough to save par. The keeper had two over for the day. Then, real disaster struck. A crooked drive at 17 was followed by that most elementary of errors. Played the wrong ball. That led to an eight, and he did well to finish in 75. There was nobody on the hill where my ball was. There was no spectators at all. It was what threw me, I guess. You know, so I just walked straight to the ball and played it. And then they started to look for gyms. Yeah, it's not very clever, yeah. Those playing late had the worst of the weather. And Seve, for one, was not new. Three practice days with no wind, and today the wind started blowing, and it was, it was difficult. And it's, it was incredible to have such a great day like yesterday, and in, in 15 hours everything changed. I mean, it was that's Scotland. But some coped in spite of it. New Zealand's Greg Turner was a couple under playing 16, then borrowed this shot from the Japanese manual on how to play Turnbury. In the end, around a 65 and the first one of these. Locker room attendant said to me before I went out, he said, 68 would be nice today. And I said, if you give me 68, I'll take it and not bother. But um, you'd love to see your name up at the top of the leaderboard at any stage of the Open Championship. But um, I'm delighted. The truth was known. I mean, I think every golfer probably dreams, dreams about leading the British Open. Um, I don't dream about it every night, but... <laughs> but um, yeah, I suppose so. So at the end of the first day, just Turner by one from Jonathan Lomas. He a shot further back, and then a host of players on two under. And one under, Nick Price, a steady start, and a round of 69. I think the course has shown its teeth a little bit. I think everyone was expecting, you know, guys to go out there and shoot 64s and 63s, but it's very, very fair. I just think, uh, you know, we're going to have a really good champion this week. Good morning. The next golf special service will be announced as soon as possible. The service to the dentist will depart. Golfers have much to thank the railways for, but for them, there might never have been a challenge to cause Turnbury at all. At the turn of the century, the Glasgow and South Western Railway Company bought an embryo course from the Marquis of Ailsa and added what was to become one of the world's great luxury golf hotels. But the Glasgow Daily Mail did not approve. It's altogether satisfactory to find that there are a few not carried away with the golf craze, but their protests are wholly unavailing. The paper didn't survive, but Turnbury did. And soon, no luxury was too extravagant. Today, the Hotel Serenity is its own advertisement. <laughs> It was a fun round of golf for me today. I, I wasn't depending too much on the yardage today. I was just sort of depending on my feel today, and my feel was right on. The calm and pleasant weather returned on day two, enabling some to make up lost ground. This putt at 16 took Mark Brooks at two under for the championship, en route for 64. Faldo, too, was fighting back. You make mistakes like what happened on 17, and uh, so I just had to come out and just carry on as if, as if nothing happened. John Daly, building on his opening 68, again went to the turn in 32, with five under and in a tie for the lead. But a lost ball at the 10th, and no less than four putts here at 11 undid all the good work. Two and a half days later, he would finish last of those who survived to play all four rounds. Young amateur Warren Bennett would have the luxury of playing the final two rounds, assured of winning the silver medal. In the second round, 67, 36 hole total of one under par, he would be the only amateur to make the cut. This, for the first few holes, it was very solid. I knew I could shoot a good score, and I was under par. I was, I was very relaxed, just playing my own game. And the putter was hot, that's all I can say. Earlier in the week, he practiced with Nick Faldo and Ian Baker Finch, an experience of the big time that helped steady the nerves for the big day. Very intimidating on the first tee. 
because all I've seen is watching them on TV, and to play with them is just a different league. Going back to that. Ian was saying, nice shot all the time. It, it settled me down for yesterday. Karnovic was another who made good progress on day two. Three under here at the ninth, he was to storm home in 32 to finish in 66. Today I played much better and uh, I mean 66 was very good. And playing with Jack Nicklaus the first two rounds was absolutely great. It was the first time I played with him and um, he encouraged me a lot in the end when I was doing well. It was just one of those days you always dreamt about playing, leading the British Open, playing with Jack Nicklaus. Late in the day, two players made significant moves. First, Brad Faxon. Shot of the day was my third shot on 14. Toughest hole of the day, I think. Couldn't quite reach. Left it to the right and short and hit a great American flop shot. And we don't get to do that over here too much. I've never played here before. The first three days in the practice and yesterday the wind was blowing, I don't know what direction it was blowing, from the south, from the west. But the golf course totally changed today, totally different. The other was Nick Price. He too had some ground to make up after a rather cautious opening 69. A uh, tough day, you know, uh, I was, couldn't wait to get on the downwind stretch. You know, the uh, first seven holes, eight holes were so different to the way we played them yesterday. I always putt well if I putt from 30 feet and I've got a good pace. That's when I seem to putt my best. And that's what I've done really well this week. I seem to be able to lob the ball out to 30 feet from the hole and still, you know, uh, have a chance to either make it or, or, or two putt with ease. So that's... Uh, and the other thing is I only brought one putter here this week too, Michelle. Pleased, <laughs> pleased a lot of people. <laughs> I had five at the US Open. <laughs> Back out at sea, Tom Watson was making a mockery of opening odds of 50 to 1 against his winning a sixth open title. This tee shot at 11 was close enough for a two and the outcome lead. And two putts at 17 were enough for another birdie as he continued to roll back the years. I had a lot of warm receptions uh, walking up to the greens today and it was, uh, it warmed me. You know, I, but I, I, love, I love playing golf over here. I feel good about the way I'm playing right now. I, uh, whatever happens uh, come Sunday, who knows? I can't predict what's going to happen. I just, uh, I just hope I'm there hoisting the cup. That was still a couple of days away. In the meantime, it was Watson by one from Parnovic and Faxon, with Price on five under. Among several on four under, Sella, Feherty and Rafferty. Watson's form brought back memories of his epic battle with Nicholas 17 years before. The contest became known as the Jewel in the Sun. The turning point came at 15 in the final round. Having trailed for much of the last two days, Watson caught Nicholas with this puck from off the green. When Nicholas missed a tiddler at 17, Watson led for the first time. And his approach to the last, all but slammed him. Nicholas wasn't finished yet. Nearly unplayable off the tee, only a player of his might could have got the ball anywhere near the green. Shot. Even with Watson virtually stone dead, Nicholas still didn't surrender. to be denied.
this time in practice. We live in them. I played with Nicholas and, and Norman and, and Price. We had uh, we had a good match, and uh, Jack and I were partners, so we you know we were pretty friendly because we were whipping them. Uh, and we, uh, yeah, we, we reminisced quite a bit about uh, my putt at 15. And uh, he said, what did I say to you when I came off the green? Didn't I didn't y'all call you a little son of a bitch? And I said, no, you didn't. That, you told me that in 1982 at the U.S. Open. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to do that, you jerk. God. This year, Nicholas was cursing himself. And even when the gun went off, he still couldn't find the magic. Yeah. Rounds of 72 exactly and 73 <laughs> meant five over par, two too many to survive the halfway cut. He was one of the greatest forces, if not the greatest force in the game of golf in my era. And it's, uh, it's sad that uh, he's not around for the last two rounds. I know he's disappointed, and it disappoints me. And Gary Player wasn't going to make the final two days either despite trying, as only he knows how. It was great today. Sun shining, the crowd was loving all the golf we were playing, and he just wanted to keep making birdies, you know. It was a lovely atmosphere. The early drama took place off the course. Greg Krause's cover had been misplaced by his caddy. Then been sent home to America in this race. Yeah. Okay. Result: five lots of three putts over the first couple of days. But then the missing weapon turned up. An emotional reunion took place in the championship office. So I walked in and they're just looking at me. Then he says, "Is this your head cover to your putter?" And I said, "Yeah." And I heard him take it off something from behind the door. So I'm like bending around the door. I says, "You got my putter?" And he says, "Is this your putter?" And just, that was like making a hundred footer for a win when I saw that putter. <laughs> I was holding back the tears. Larry Mize's drama was both on and off the course. An upset stomach meant he wasn't able to face breakfast, but even so, still went round in 64. The toast I ordered for breakfast, I took it with me in my golf bag because I couldn't eat it, and I was able to get that down on the golf course, so I had the course on toast. So to the action. Zeller at the first. Good enough for an opening three, the ideal start. Ronan Rafferty at the fourth. In off the bank, and this would be his second birdie of the day. Price at the second. Three and six under. And one of the early starters, Scotland's Andrew Coulter, tidying up for a fine round of 66. A superb effort for someone who admitted to being very nervous before he set out. Price now at the third. Come on, win. Come on. Not bad. Come on. Two putts would mean only a car. Also at the third, Watson from the back of the three. He does seem to make a habit of this sort of thing in major championships. Price now at the fifth. And another superb hour. Yet again, the chance goes begging. Poor reward for some really great approach play. All most <laughs> Faxon from just short of the green at the sixth. On his day, one of the very best putters in the world. Price at the seventh, this time with a really short one for a birdie. Gets it and into a tie with Watson. Fairty was enjoying this. This putt for a three at the tenth. In she goes, two under for the day, five under for the championship. 
Watson, second to seven. Two big hits, and two putts from there will put him at eight under and in the lead on his own. Zeller, playing with 30, joins in the fun. Six under after 12. Early birdies had raised Greg Norman's hopes of another open victory at Turnbury. They were to be drowned by that burn at 16. In the end, he would finish just one under for the day, half a dozen. Faxon at the 10th. Putter now in full flow. Three, eight under, and a share of the lead. Parnovic at 12. After a poor start, three birdies and six holes take him to seven under. Zeller for a three at 16. And a share of the lead with Faxon and Watson. Now, his second to the 17th. Two putts from there will give him the outright lead. Raffin playing the final hole. And this shot will set up another birdie for a round of 65. And under, and just a day to go. Nick Price back at 15 as usual with long-time caddy squeaky. With him through thick and thin. And not too much thin in recent years. I'm just really happy with the way I played today. Uh, it seems like every day so far uh, my game's got a little better and, and today I certainly played. Um, my tee to green game was better than yesterday even though my score wasn't but uh, um, I didn't hold any uh, bonus putts today, anything over 15 feet. There were, well, one I suppose on number uh, 15 there, but the rest were all uh, inside of 12, you know, 12, 14 feet. Moving up, but Watson down. A drop shot at 14, and in trouble here at 15. Get up there. Come on. Suddenly, the game's a bit of a struggle. but in the end could do no better than a 69. In contrast, Seller is having the time of his life. Two putts from there for 64, and the lead in the clubhouse. Look at the various David Fairty round in 66, this is a lovely game to watch. Didn't feel anywhere near as nervous today as I did in the second round of the, of the qualifying. I had such a desire to play in this tournament, you know, I really didn't want to go home that week early and sit there watching this on the box. You know, it's a nightmare watching this tournament on the box. Still out on the course, Parnovic's up and down round continues. Birdie yeah, here at 16, another at 17, all add up to 68 and 800. Faxon, his second to the par 5, 17th. And with the help of the contours, two putts will bring him level with Zeller. Same hole, price for his four. him to nine under, but a five at the last will be his only blemish of the day. 
leaving one behind the leaders, Zeller and Faxon. It's not going to be a question of sitting around and making pars and waiting for the odd birdie to fall in because there's too much experience. I, I know Fuzzy wants to win and Tom Watson is playing great, but then I also want it very badly as well. So, with a round to go, it's a tie at the top. And behind them, four players on eight under. Fairty, a further stroke behind. Close by this dramatic action, by constant reminders of Turnberry's turn in the past. In two world wars, it gave up its sporting charms to help the nation's cause. Twice an airfield, pilots were trained here, and a monument beside the 12th Green remembers those who gave their lives both here and in mortal combat. Surely these ravages would be too great for golf to be contemplated here again. Architect Mackenzie Ross thought otherwise. Miles of runways were dug up, thousands of tons of concrete carried away, and from all this chaos, the mighty Elsa course slowly emerged. A battle then, and one of a different kind today. Indeed, Turnbury is a piece of ground that's been fought over for centuries. Robert the Bruce was born here at Turnbury Castle 700 years ago. The castle ruins still stand on the edge of the ninth. And it was just across the water on the Isle of Arran where that spider inspired him to try and try again. It spurred him on to victory and never to give up is very much part of the golfer's creed. Right on this end rock formation you can see a forehead and then a the eyes, the nose, the mouth, and then a goatee beard. And he's looking straight at Bruce's castle, and that's supposed to be Bruce's face. And that's the ruins of Bruce's castle over there. We haven't got room for two platforms in here. Michael Banalek, the secretary of the Royal and Ancient, here. is responsible for the smooth running of the championship. Everything must be in place come the big day, and although requests must be heeded, by no means all, can be granted. Uh, could you move the lighthouse then, please? Yes. <laughs> the biggest problem we had was one of our officials getting locked in the lavatory. <laughs> we had an urgent phone call from the house where he was staying to say that uh, he was locked in the lavatory and he'd be late for his time. And so as a result, uh, we had to send out a carpenter and uh, all he could do in the end was break the door down and we got him out. Just passing a great hole now, the 13th, which has a raised green. And uh, you, if, if you don't actually hit the surface in the right place, your ball won't stop on the green. I think it's one of the best holes on the course. Banalek and Turnbury go back a long way. It was here in 1961 he won the first of his five amateur championships. And naturally, he's got fond memories of this part of Scotland. Well, it uh, has a special place for me. I liked it then and I like it now. It's got everything. It's got the scenery, it's got a magnificent golf course, and there's no hotel in the world, I don't think, that's better than Turnbury Hotel. It's going to be a shootout. Just hope that my putter gets going because there's too much experience in that leaderboard. There you go. Good luck, mate. of 64 restores some pride, but not the title, but the him is holding back. For Mize, though, it's a case of carrying on where he left off yesterday. Paul's brand, finishing as he wished he'd begun. 10 under for the last two rounds and an eventual tie for fourth place. And when
when Zeller's whistling, Zeller's trying. Ten under after two. Ferdi at the sixth. In pursuit. A couple of holes later, Zeller's back where he began at nine under, and the champions still to emerge. The thing that I was worried about the most was that if I hadn't, if I hadn't won today, how many other opportunities I was going to have. You know, the first five, six holes, I was just trying too hard. There were so many ups and downs today, you know, both uh, physically from on the golf course and also mentally. It just uh, it tested, I suppose, every, uh, every facet of my... Every bit of my temperament and my character today and you know, that's what a major championship does. trying and succeeding nine under after seven at the same hole Parnovic struggling Great shot. but he'll still get away with a par Best of those at the seventh, Ronan Rafferty. This chip for an eagle three. Price two having to work hard. I was actually surprised that no one really did anything until Jesper started making birdies on the early in the back nine, but I suppose the the front nine did play a lot harder than it has done in the previous three days and with the added pressure of the championship at stake, uh, no one seemed to be doing anything. But now they turn for home, it's a different story. Fairty for a three at the tenth. Watson, though, is going back. He's putting in tatters his dreams receding like the tide. So Watson now no longer there. Two shots gone at eight and two more at nine. Faxon two has dropped away. Parnovic at the 11th, 10 straight pars. And at last a birdie to join Zeller in the lead. Price, though, it's still a hard day at the office. I was trying to be patient, and when I got the birdie on 11, I, my momentum started going, and uh, it was a lot of fun. Fun, maybe, but deep commitment, too.
consecutive birdie and two shots clear. But just a hole behind, someone's on his trail. I just love playing in the thick of things. Um, it's really exhilarating to go out there and to, to hit the ball well and to perform under intense pressure and to hit, to knock putts in, um, to drive the ball down the middle of the fairway when you have to. It's, it, 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 it just puts so much confidence in you. Eight under once more. That will be the end of Pistol Moon. Still, it's not all plain sailing for Price. Even so, he'll escape with the car. At 15, Parnovic in trouble. Well out, but it'll be a drop shot, and for the rest, a first hint of fallibility. So now, the gap just won. Parnival ahead of the Here, the duelists begin to pull away, leaving the rest of them. My whole round was set up by the two up and downs that I made on, on 13 and 14. And if 13 was good, the one here at 14 bordered on the spectacular. Towers and TV cables may seem the great but it's the bare large, rough covered bank in front of the green that make this shot really a bit of a gamble. It's strange because I've been practicing that little running chip shot because you use it so many times. I've probably hit it two or three times this week from the fairway, though, not from the rough. But because it had been trampled down so much, um, it was so firm and there wasn't much uh, grass just in front of the, the green there. And I just hit it perfectly, you know, a little running 7-iron and it looked like it was going to go in at one stage. And how important was that? Parnovic isn't finished either. Second to 16. Not bad, but not good enough to close the gap. Parnovic at 17. Short and left in two at this reachable par five. A difficult chip, but a five at this stage would be a definite. to go three ahead. Yeah. Price, though, hasn't given up. Vital if he's to have a chance. Yeah. Ten under, two holes left, but just one for Parnovic. I heard a lot of roars from behind all the time, so I I knew they were doing well. And um, but I decided not to look at the scoreboard. Actually, I usually look. I have to say, I I, I was so focused on the back nine there. I just didn't bother really looking and uh, I thought it didn't really matter. Great shot, there you go. I thought it was screaming on every hole behind us, so I, I thought someone behind were doing real well as well. So I just tried to keep focused and try to 
finished with three birdies and um, the way it turned out, it, uh, I, I sh maybe should have played smarter shot at 18. at 18 to the relative calm at 17. It was sitting pretty deep in the bank and uh, it was, uh, I mean, it's very high, fluffy grass, so I just tried to play it like a bunker shot and uh, kind of hope for it to come out right. Now it came out very soft. And for friends and family, in this case, fiancé Mia, the helplessness and the agony of heaven. the 18s I saw I was leading by two and uh, then it was you know then all these feelings come up and you say what have I done I knew I had to either finish birdie birdie or make eagle I knew walking on that green that I had to make that putt and I worked so hard with squeak on getting the line and we read it I knew it was going to be close, but I didn't think it was still going to go in, you know, and uh, when it jumped in the right side there, I mean, I just about jumped out my skin there. Then everything just fell to the ground for me. My heart rate was probably up to about 250 there after I made that putt on 17 and it didn't slow down until I made that one on 18. I made sure Squeak was standing with me because I said to him, I said, you come here and you enjoy this with me because this might be the last time either of us ever have this opportunity. And um, we walked up there together and uh, um, he, he knows how much this meant to me. Now it's Price's Lady. You can only wait and watch. When you reach down deep inside yourself and uh, you surprise yourself sometimes, uh, and today I surprised myself a little bit coming down the stretch. I knew I knew I had it in me, but it just normally doesn't happen at that when you need it the most. And uh, today it did, so it was it's a fairy tale ending for me.
was playing well. Um, I couldn't tell that he was. You know, <laughs> Warren Bennett, the silver man, the leading man. I attribute my uh, grandparents with this tournament because uh, they died last week and uh, I didn't have time to say goodbye to them. So uh, uh, if you really care for someone, make sure they know about it because you never know when it's too late. Thanks a lot. The winner of the gold medal and the champion golfer for the year with a score of 268, Nick Price. I think it was best summed up, 1982, I had my left hand on this trophy. 1988, I had my right hand on this trophy. Now at last, I finally got both hands on it. <laughs> and does it feel good? <laughs> Popular of champions, after the cheers of the crowd, the plaudits of the press. It was something that I really wanted to do so badly, you know. Uh, I can't believe they got my name on there so quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and to get it on, took four rounds under 70, as well as a score to match Tom Watson's from all those years ago. <laughs> Now, for Bryce, it's time for the party to start. Where is he? I know what I've done, but it just sometimes you just have to, the reality has to set in, you know, and uh, that's why I didn't want to let go of this trophy. I was holding on to it so tight when they gave it to me. Somebody take your cup. Here we go, that's great. Nick, this is George Brown. Yeah, we met George on 18. You met George. George. You want me some money too, by the great way. Great job. Oh, I'm that's glad. That's, that's music to my ears. Thank you. You said the greens were lousy, by the way. All the holes in the right position for you today. Uh, next time I come out, you'd have to walk around with me and teach me how they break, because I still didn't get them right. You got the I've got a couple right. of them right, yeah. You've got the 17th right. Really nice. Thanks, George. Thanks, George. Great shape. Of course, it's a great shape. It's an unbelievable job. When it finally comes your way, uh, you kind of figure out, well, why did the good Lord shine down on me, you know? The golfing God certainly smiled down on me today.